and you ah, the, no, okay. Okay, so I'm Nathan Check. I'm from Omaha Central High School. <laughs> a little better? No? Okay, this poem's dedicated to my grandpa who was hopefully watching, but, well, wait, no, he doesn't know how to use a computer. <laughs> uh, anyway. I remember one time while I was getting picked up from school, my grandfather told me to put on my seatbelt. Since when do you care about my safety, I asked. And he replied, I don't. I just don't want you breaking my windshield. <laughs> this is the same man who handed me a $20 bill, and just to piss off my dad, he told me to spend it on beer. I was 12 years old at the time. <laughs> and in case you haven't caught on, he's got a pretty sick sense of humor, but maybe that's why we get along so well. You know, I promise you, he has his sweet side. I remember the first time he told me about when he met my grandmother at a ballroom dance in Lincoln. Despite the fact that he showed up with two left feet and no one to dance with. But when he saw her, confidence convinced him that he had the moves to win her hearts. And he did. He said from that moment on, he knew he wouldn't want to dance with anyone else but her for the rest of his life. I think about that story a lot, because my grandfather taught me what to look for in a life partner. Our elders have a lot to offer, and he offered me imagination. In, in his living room, I would construct century-old castles, fortresses of solitude, entire empires designed by my mind's eye and built from the ground up thanks to his endless supply of itchy wool blankets and impenetrable pillow building blocks. I remember one time after watching all three Star Wars movies in a row, I challenged him to a duel. And don't worry, it was the first trilogy, because we all know Jar Jar Binks was an abomination. I was the Sith Lord, wielding my lightsaber broomstick. He was the Jedi Master, a paler, taller version of Master Yoda. But I would always play the villain because I could never imagine him being anything other than my biggest hero. Hero. Decorated war veteran. He once said that politicians are the ones who start the wars, but the poor are the ones sent to fight them. And so he was stationed in Europe in 1951. <clears throat> he didn't know why he was there, but he didn't care. And so, September 1951, he's climbed the Eiffel Tower twice. November 1951, he has sailed through the canals of Amsterdam and makes note that trading is done off the boats there. June 1952, he has seen the ruins of Munich, Germany, and seen the horrors of World War II. He doesn't remember why he's there. He asks himself, why? Why am I here? And so he was eager to return back to the United States. Despite, despite returning to Europe, the land where his family tree planted its roots, he didn't feel like home to him. He was lost in a foreign land and eager to come back to those who loved him most. And when he did, he decided to attend a ballroom dances of Lincoln rather than enlist again. Now that I think of it, before dropping me off at the house he grew up in, I grew up in, he would always speak in his native tongue. Yete doma. You are home. But if home is where the heart is, and this stage is where I belong, this microphone is my weapon of choice, and this is where I fight my battles. I choose to live in this moment with you, the people who have filled my chest with inspiration and given my ribs a reason to encage these poems that have been mimicking heart attacks every time I let my glossophobia get the best of me, every time I was convinced that my voice should be silenced. But my grandfather taught me that if silence is golden, then my voice is platinum. So let me be the first to tell you all the audience. No, no, you, my equals, you, my friends. Let me be the first to tell you all. Thank you. I am home.